if we really focus on good care for each other, we're so much better positioned to offer good care for the patients. Welcome to Doc Working, the Whole Physician Podcast. I'm Dr. Jen Barna, and today I'm excited to introduce to you our guest, Dr. Natasha Beauvais. She is a physician at Northern Virginia Family Practice Associates, also known as NVFP. Dr. Beauvais is a family medicine physician and works in a concierge healthcare in Northern Virginia. Prior to joining NVFP, Dr. Beauvais served as a physician at Unity Healthcare in Washington, D.C., and co-founded the Women's Mentoring Program for the American Medical Women's Association. She has received the Joseph Collins Award for Excellence in Arts and Letters and the University of Connecticut Family Medicine Award. Dr. Natasha Beauvais, welcome to Doc Working, the Whole Physician Podcast. Thanks, Jen. It's nice to meet you Good and good to be here. It's so great to have you here. I'm really interested in hearing about your journey, and I'm I'm so thrilled to have you as a guest on the podcast. How are things going there? You're in Northern Virginia, Alexandria, right? Yeah, I'm in Northern Virginia. We're we're doing well. It's good to be mostly back in normal medicine mode. When you say back in normal medicine mode, do you mean since the pandemic began? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. We have a concierge family practice in Northern Virginia, and we're just about to open another one in D.C. in September. I'd love to just hear about your journey in medicine. I just read a little bit about your background, and you trained at University of Connecticut and then did your residency at Stony Brook. I was at Stony Brook as an undergrad. I have so many questions about your whole journey because I see also that you were one of the developers of the Women's Mentoring Program at the American Medical Women's Association, and also that you have four kids. So I have a ton of questions Mm -hmm. about how you've managed it all and everything that you've chosen to do. Would you mind just backing up and telling us just an overview of your journey? Sure. I think my role in the American Medical Women's Association is pretty discreet. I just was a part of starting that group up for students, you know, 25 years ago when I was in medical school for my local chapter. So it was pretty, pretty discreet. I'm very passionate about women in medicine. And I think I've gotten a lot out of women's leadership courses about physicians in in leadership. So those have been very meaningful to me and very life-changing as I got further into my career. I do have four children. I had my first child during residency and my second one the month after residency was over. Thanks to some really lovely encouragement from my residency director, I did finish my residency on time, but I was open to doing it half time and taking a few more years to get it done. And then I worked part time for a long time, probably almost 15 years as a way of being more home after school than not. However, I've been having so much fun really in the last few years at my job that I have just decided to take on more and more. And my youngest child is 12 and he does not get the benefit of having mom home after school like my older children did when I was working less. How did you find the difference between having a child during residency versus after residency, just out of curiosity, or anyone who may be listening and trying to decide when they might want to have kids. I I had both my kids as a medical student. So I'm curious about your experience as a resident Mm -hmm. and post-residency. I think kind of every time is fine to have kids and no time is perfect to have kids. And you just have to figure it out and not really let your career override because there's only a finite number of years you can have kids and a finite number of opportunities. I think, honestly, it would have been much harder to have my kids in medical school than in residency. So I'm sure there's a challenge, burden to carry, and a blessing that goes along with it, no matter where you do it. And it's just a matter of having to say, okay, how, how can I figure it out? In residency, I took, you know, my, my director was very flexible. He allowed me, I had a month off, and then he allowed me to do like a, a research month. So I was doing research, but it wasn't extremely demanding at all. And I was really home with my daughter. And I don't even remember how we handled the third month, or maybe I was only off for two months. I really can't remember how I handled it. It was a long time ago, but I was very, very grateful to do that. And I had the benefit of my mother-in-law who would 
babysit twice a week and she would actually take the subway with the baby to my residency where I had a lunch meeting every day to do lectures and I would get to nurse the baby during my lunch meeting twice a week. So that was really taking care of me as well as taking care of the baby. And I was so grateful to her for making me feel like I could still be a mom. That is wonderful. It's amazing to be able to have that kind of support. And it sounds like that's influenced your practice as well. We specialize, we're family physicians. Actually, we have, we now had two internists as well. So we really do primary care for the family. I do see a lot of women, but I have a lot of male patients as well. I did have a kind of an instantaneous moment in a job interview very early in my career that helped me realize how important it is to focus on what other people need in their work. I was applying for a job at Unity Healthcare, which is a public health umbrella for lots of public health in Washington, D.C. And the director was interviewing me for a very tiny job. I mean, a very part-time starter job for me that uh, was mostly designed to keep my toe in the water while I was mostly at home with two children. And during the interview, the doctor who was interviewing me said, oh, well, well, what you need is, and I don't even remember what it was. It was something about scheduling or flexibility. And I just couldn't believe that she was asking me what I needed during my job interview. And that was a tiny sentence that represented a huge shift to me in how all of us can approach work. What does the person need to succeed? What does the person need to accept the job to get, you know, to feel like they have their bases covered and to feel supported? I do hope that that's what we try to do in our work now as employers is to try to listen to what people need. And if people have a different scheduling need, you know, one of our staff members needs to leave at 2 p.m., we can work on figuring that out. And I was very lucky for my whole career to work part-time for the first 15 years. And I think that's, you know, that's something not everybody realizes that's possible. I still have another 30 years of work to do. So I think if you're happy enough, it can morph into something where you take on more and more work if you choose to, or maybe people are happy doing less work and that would be fine too, because then we would be healthy and still be able to provide care for others. And be able to provide better care for others, I would say as well. I think you've hit on something that is so critical, especially in this time where there are conversations going on everywhere about retention and of course Mm -hmm. about physician burnout and how to prevent physician burnout, which is something that we specialize in at Doc Working. And the whole concept of focusing on the needs of employees and building a culture that strengthens resilience, knowing that healthcare workers are already resilient but resilience isn't static. And it's really important to have programs in place that help us to appreciate each other as team members, that help us to see the strengths in the other people on our team and be able to really pull together as a team and ultimately Mm -hmm. provide better care because we're meeting the needs of each other Mm -hmm. first. Mm -hmm. And I think if that's the kind of culture that you've been able to create in your practice, then it really can serve as a model to other practices. And it certainly can send out an important message to anyone who's wondering how they could improve their recruitment and retention. And that is to find out what people need and find a way to provide that so that people can stay long-term and you can really build a team that works well together, that is there for the long haul. And that serves patients better. Patients don't want to be changing doctors and changing providers um, mm-hmm. clinicians every couple of years. So I think it also helps in the in a competitive environment because patients want to go somewhere where they know who they're going to be seeing and they know that they can rely on the staff there. How did you decide to go into concierge medicine? I was working as the traditional doctor in a doctor's office that was hybrid. There was a concierge branch and a traditional care branch. And when my former employer retired, he asked me to take over his patient panel, something I really had to think about for a couple of years before I decided to do it. And 
I went into it with a bit of caution, I think, but I've been extremely, extremely happy to be practicing that way. And I think what you're talking about, you know, the doctor doesn't go away. You know, we, you know, the doctors in this model are very stable. Like we don't have any turnover. <laughs> um, people are here because they love medicine. They want to do it in a more thorough way. And so that's what this practice allows. The other thing that we're really learning about in terms of not just preventing burnout, but in terms of really providing a road to job satisfaction for everyone, not just for the physicians, is we've been working with the science of adult cognitive development and something called immunity to change, which was developed by some professors in the education school at Harvard. They have a system that we're just really starting to implement it but it's starting to help us give skills that help take roadblocks away for all of us, for the physicians, for the nurses, for the receptionist, for the biller, for the administrator. And I think it's been really, really interesting in the early pilots that we've been doing to allow us to see a place that we don't realize we're stuck. That has been very life-giving. And then when people feel like they're growing at work, work is fun. Work is more fun, I think, when there's more, there's new stuff to be learned. That really ties into everything that we do at Doc Working with Coaching. And then our course, our foundational course, we've partnered with StressPal and our coaches are on the platform there. And it is for the whole care team with the concept that everyone on the team can work better together as they're growing as individuals and also see the benefits of knowing the same vocabulary and the same type of retraining in order to retrain your brain to deal with stress in the heat of the moment Mm -hmm. and find ways to thrive in that environment. And so I, I really am interested in hearing about your experience with that type of a program, because there's such a huge need for this all over the world, really, right now in healthcare. And I think providing this type of training and this type of mindset of resources and ongoing support to the healthcare teams to ultimately benefit them both personally and professionally, leading to that level of high level of job satisfaction, which then leads to better patient care, is such a critical concept in an environment where we've gotten a little bit away from that. And I think people are feeling overburdened by charting requirements and requirements that get them away from patient care. And people really want to get back to that sense of purpose. I think it's a way of also learning to recognize where you have control so that you can put your energy into those areas. So tell me about your experience a little bit more. How big is your group and how long have you guys been participating in this program? Our group is currently about 20 and growing gradually. Really, we got interested in, I got interested in this work just before the pandemic, and we did a a kind of quick and fast trial of doing the work really early on in the pandemic, which completely failed because my ramp up to the project was not well executed. But I think it was, it, it was enough to get me really, really curious about how it could work. And so I did several workshops myself to learn the science and read a few books about it. And then in just in December last year, we started with a very small pilot group within our office about just to have a, an outside facilitator help us learn the process. And we all had a collective work goal that we were committed to working on. And we were mostly just helping ourselves see where we were with respect to that particular project. And we've now done two pilots and we're about to start a third one next week. And I would say what was surprisingly meaningful in the very first one was the simple act of having a meeting with stable people and doing a check-in. And three out of four of us had very substantial, significant things going on outside of work. And during that check-in, we were really able to just recognize each other in whatever was happening in and out of the office. And I think just having a place where something that was happening out of the office had a place to be aired, allowed everyone to just recognize where everyone was at and then move forward and created a lot more trust between the four of us as we were going through that few months. 
And then at the end of the process, I felt like we were just able to speak much more honestly with each other. And the, the level of trust between us had changed. So that was the first pilot that we did. And that wasn't really the intent. You know, it wasn't, I didn't realize that what we needed to do going into it was build trust, but that's what felt the most meaningful coming out of it. What was your goal going into it? That is really valuable that that increased trust came out of it. I'm just Mm -hmm. curious going into it, what your intention was. So the intention, my intention and the intention of the project is to help each individual notice some things that they're committed to that are perhaps getting in their way. And so they could be good things. Take a very, very simplistic example. I would like to be a better communicator with my team, but I'm also committed to seeing patients and I'm also committed to seeing my kids. And so if I'm committed to seeing patients over and above communicating with my team, then I'll never get it done because unless I change something about how I'm approaching it. So that's on a kind of a very, very simple, um, simple level. The other thing that happens is I think you mentioned something about what do you have the capacity to control? And I think that this program really helps us develop insights about where we can focus our energies and where we will have an influence. And so to take my own example, again, in this model, I was frustrated about people not responding during meetings. And if I focus that frustration externally and I'm irritated with other people because they did not respond, then I can just stay mad and not really get anything done. But if I recognize in myself that I have an opportunity to do some research and learn how to run a better meeting and create a system that feels more secure so people will be more willing to talk during meetings or back up even further and create tiny meetings for other people to begin to develop their own sense of trust amongst the team before they'll even ever talk in a meeting, then I can look at myself and my own capacity in what I could do to change that situation. And so it, that's an example for me that's been very meaningful. I mean, it was very helpful for someone to point out to me that I wasn't doing research about how to have a better meeting. And if that can be taken on by each person individually to recognize their own locus of control and their own capacity for changing at things, you know, if they recognize the phone isn't getting answered, for example, wouldn't it be cool if the person who can recognize that also can work to change how the phone is getting answered instead of waiting for two other levels of people to make a decision to change it, which won't happen for a long time. So it's a, it, it, I think it helps us shift our own mindset. I'll be the first one to admit it's shifting my mindset. It is tremendous. I agree. I think starting from a place of overwhelm and feeling lack of control, it is a huge mind shift. When you begin to realize where you do have control, you realize you have more options than you thought you did. You realize you can influence things that you previously maybe just assumed were in the control of someone else. But actually, as you mentioned, even something as small as someone answering the phones That's something that could give you a lot of peace in the course of of your day. If you can have some influence to get a problem like that solved, and chances are you can when you begin to realize that you do have some agency over a number of little things like that, that can improve your day considerably. When you get the whole team involved, it really gets everyone into that troubleshooting mindset. People are interested in hearing other people's ideas and interested in implementing them. Have you seen any other simple kind of changes that have been really significant to you and your practice? I think one of the most powerful things is realizing how critical it is for us to be cultivating skills in others instead of just problem solving. And I would say this this is true for me, and it's also very true for people who are part of our administrative management group is to realize that perhaps we got, we came into this job. There's the book, you know, what got you here won't get you there. (laughs) And so like, maybe we all came into this job with a certain set of skills and a certain mindset or approach about, okay, I'm, I'm a doer. I'm going to get everything done. And then I think one downfall of any organization is to rely on those people who naturally are the doers and get everything done and never work to grow the skills of all people. 
So then the doers get, get really, really tired. <laughs> and then they have no, nothing left to give. But I think what began to become visible to us within these groups is, wow, I'm limited by my own time. And on the very short-sighted approach, I might want to just do everything today because I know how to do it and it's going to be faster if I just do it. However, that will mean I never get to do anything else besides do all those things that I already know how to do today. And if I work to train someone else, and if my manager works to train someone else, then all of us get to do something different, right? The, the newest person gets to learn the skills of the more seasoned person, and the more seasoned person gets to learn the skills of the top people, and the top people get to grow the organization and do really different things. And so each person, if we recognize that our most important job is to grow others, suddenly we really shift how we approach in any problem. We're not really just supposed to get everything done. That is beautifully said. I love the concept of cultivating skills in others because ultimately that does lead to a stronger, more resilient institutional culture but also it leads to a culture where people have a higher job satisfaction. Mm -hmm. Because if you think about it, it's a culture of care. And we all went into this profession because we want to care for other people, but we also want to be cared for as individuals. And so if you're going to work and you feel like you're in a culture where people care about you, then you can turn your energies into caring for someone else. And when you think about like a family, for example, the concept of a family is that it's a group of people who care about each other. You know that those people care about you. And if you think about how much time you spend at work, you're spending 40 plus hours a week and often many more hours than that a week if you're working as a physician or healthcare worker. It's really critical to be working in a place where there is a culture of care and a culture of resilience. And that sort of cultivating skills in others is a way of showing that you care, really, because mm -hmm. you're saying to someone, you may not know how to do this now, but we're going to show you how to do this. Mm -hmm. And we have confidence in you that you can learn this. And we're going to work with you until you learn it. So mm -hmm. we're not going to just be frustrated that we can take the time and make sure that you learn it well. I really love that. I, I love what you're doing. And it sounds like it is paying off in spades for the people in your organization, as well as the level of care that you can deliver. Yeah, I like the recharacterization of it as cultivating skills is caring, because I think what we really try to remember with every question about whatever we're doing in our practice is, is this good care? And, and mostly we're talking about medical care for patients. And of course, we really want to be caring for our staff as well. And we want to really make sure that our culture is healthy for staff, that is a good care. For example, if someone's going to be late, we, are, we have a very good culture now. Of, we have a, a group chat and people will say, I'm going to be 15 minutes late. And that allows people to recognize, oh, you know, that person's job will be unfilled for 15 minutes. I better fill it and I think that's a way of caring for your coworker, right? Like, okay, this person is late. I have to care for that person. And I think if we really focus on good care for each other, we're so much better positioned to offer good care for the patients. But sometimes I think in healthcare, we're under such high demand to do good healthcare for the patient. And we're so behind all the time that it, it's hard to take the time to create a system where we can really focus on being good to each other, which of course would then make us provide better care for patients. Absolutely. I, I really appreciate you coming on the podcast and talking about this concept with me, because I think it is so critical to healthcare, burnout prevention, longevity within the field of medicine. Well, thanks, Jen, for having me. It was a lovely conversation. I, and I'd love to learn more about your anti-stress work and how you can create cultures where it sounds like you're cultivating the same thing. Yes, we are. Doc Working has a program that is an ongoing subscription for healthcare providers, physicians, and everyone on the entire care team. We have different levels of support that we can provide for individuals, but we can also provide support to entire institutions. Mm -hmm. And also by creating a community of 
physicians in what we call the doctor's lounge. And then we have a community for PAs and nurse practitioners and one for the care team itself. And that allows people from all over the country to be able to feel a part of a community and to be able to be in a safe space where we can talk about the kind of struggles that we have. Having a place where you can connect with other people and realize that some of the things that you might feel vulnerable about, once you begin to talk with people and connect with people all over the country, you start to realize you're not isolated in that struggle. And it's really helpful, I think, to be able to give yourself permission to be more vulnerable. It's great that you have a whole community of people where that communication can happen. Absolutely. Where are you in Virginia? I'm in Winchester, Virginia at the moment. I was able to find a spot at Shenandoah University in the library here, Smith Library, due to the kindness of the people in the visitor center. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, what, yeah. how creative. <laughs> I'm really fascinated by the concept of a digital nomad type of work. I don't do locums currently. I work with a practice that I've been with since 2011, but I do have some flexibility in terms of when I can work as a radiologist. And so I think for physicians that actually there is a lot of flexibility. You mentioned part-time work earlier. Mm -hmm. There's also so much flexibility with the ability to do locums. You could do that during your vacation time, or you can do that as a career itself or mm -hmm. you know, as mm -hmm. a temporary move to give you some flexibility. So the idea of being able to record a podcast and work remotely is something I am experimenting with at the moment. Yeah, well, what a great experiment to, to go do that, and especially to find Wi-Fi in the Shenandoah as you have to work at it. <laughs> yeah, it was a little bit of a challenge. Thank you so much for coming and talking with me on the podcast. I'd love to hear how things go as you're entering this next stage of this program that you guys are working on. So thank you so much, Dr. Natasha Bovey. Thank you for coming on the podcast and talking with me today. And I would love to talk with you again in the future. At DocWorking, we're here to help you maximize your potential on your own terms and help you live your best life. You told us what you need and want, and we built this for you. Whatever your journey is, you have options. You can choose to live the life you want to live. We see you. We get you. And now let's get you in the driver's seat of your own life so you can find purpose in your work and everything you do and every choice you make. Top executives, athletes, actors all achieve greatness with the support of professional coaches. As a healthcare professional, you deserve ongoing coaching support toward achieving your career goals and living your best life as you define it on your own terms. We have created this specifically for you with CME credit at docworking.com. Please go to docworking.com and check out our quick balance to burnout quiz to see where you are on the balance to burnout continuum right now. The results might surprise you. Taking this simple first step may change your life for the better. And until next time, thank you for listening to Doc Working, the Whole Physician Podcast.